Hey, welcome to the podcast. Today I am talking to Tony Castillo. Tony is an elite sports nutrition expert empowering athletes, business leaders, and performance-driven individuals reach their goals through optimal nutrition. With experience working with Major League Baseball teams like the Toronto Blue Jays and the University of Florida, Tony's journey from an overweight student to a wellness advocate fuels his mission. And he is on a mission to provide individualized tactical strategies to improve your overall performance through nutrition and lifestyle modifications. Tony, welcome to the pod. Raul, Raul, not rule. What is up? <laughs> oh, man, if you know, this is going to be fun. Yeah, man, I'm excited. This is good. This is good. Dude, there's so many different angles that we can take around not just nutrition or optimal performance, but let's set the stage. Entrepreneurs, business owners, founders, leaders, I don't care if you're a VP, if you're a sales manager, if you're on the sales calls, if you're dialing, whatever you're doing, if you're running a coffee shop, if you're a stay-at-home mom, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're running a business, like we need to have energy throughout the day. Totally. And I think there's this fallacy of this peak performance or optimal performance that we can have. I think that's like a thing that we'll never achieve, but we can achieve optimal personal performance for your lifestyle, for the goals that you want. And I know that having young kids, running the business, the stressors of life, like how do we balance that? And I want to throw it all at you here. We can dissect it as we go, but there's stressors in life. There's stressors at work. There's stressors at business. We also probably work out and do weird workouts or heavy workouts or endurance workouts, right? Yep, absolutely. Balancing that out with what nutrition, what kind of food supplements, what kind of things do I need to take? What research do I do? Like it can be overwhelming. And I want to put that on your plate. Like, where do we start? Well, one, honestly, it's really with what's behind you and what the name of this podcast is. You have to do good work. You have to show up and do it consistently. And I'm not trying to just plug the name of the podcast or plug what's behind you. It's really honestly what most entrepreneurs miss out at when it comes to nutrition. Most hmm. of these VPs, because they hop on all these different fads. We hear trends, from those yeah, people yeah. that say, do this. I'm a peak performer, so you should take this greens powder. They do it. It tastes like crap. They don't know why they're doing it. They've been told it makes them feel better. They have some sort of placebo effect, so they keep taking it, but it really does absolutely nothing. If anything, it, it might be harming them than helping them. So it's doing the good work. And I think starting low, those low hanging fruits, honestly, the one thing we said before this call was to have hydration and you brought water. You're already doing the good work, Raul. So having that water is something most entrepreneurs, leaders miss out on because they say, well, I typically have enough water throughout the day. And I ask them, are you drinking half your body weight in ounces? Oh no, I just grab a cup or a glass whenever I can. They might travel a lot. Being that I worked with a lot of athletes, I wanted them to be at peak performance as we were just talking about. And mm -hmm. now working with entrepreneurs, they travel for work all the time. Even in this post COVID world, they're on planes. Well, when you're on a plane for every hour you're in flight, you actually need to drink an eight, an extra eight ounces of water per oh, hour really? because you're at a higher altitude. The pressure on the plane is not for human performance. It's for human survival, meaning you're going to breathe more out. So that jet lag, that fatigue is mm. going to cause you to show up to that meeting or that conference or whatever you're going to. Or when Raul come visit me in Miami to do a workout together, I don't want him to be fatigued. I want him to be ready and pumped for that workout. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, you got to be drinking eight ounces of water per hour of flight. Okay. Oh, wow. So it's that hydration that I think is the number one thing that most entrepreneurs fail because they try to do all these biohacks, but they're not even getting in enough water. And if our body's 60% water and that's the one thing we're lacking, how can we fix that? Literally just drinking more water. And when we have that decreased performance, and what do I mean by that? When we're two to 3% dehydrated, so that's when we're thirsty, we might be hungry, when our urine color doesn't look like lemonade. And I'm sure you talk about urine all the time on here. I'm hey, saying that is, as a joke. We, we gotta know, know we know, gotta yeah. know. <laughs> Uh, first question people come on what color is urine weird podcast i thought we we're here to do good work but yeah. if it looks like lemonade you're in the sweet spot if it looks clear if it looks like apple juice or darker you're dehydrated so that's an easy way for entrepreneurs to know but that two to three percent dehydration can affect our performance from anywhere from seven to ten percent so if really? you're an entrepreneur ten percent of profits ten percent of your work that's a big chunk of change yeah anything you do ten percent is a is a big deal so in order to increase your performance by 10%, you should be drinking an adequate amount of water, which is at least half your body weight in ounces. And that doesn't include if you're flying. You talked about stress. Stress also affects water retention. 
We haven't spoken about if you're working out, how much water do you have to rehydrate with after a workout? So I'm literally just like baseline, just drink half your body weight in ounces of water. Oh, wow. Okay. So I carry around this jug and people make fun of me for it, but I've never really shared it on the pod. I drink like a gallon or one or two of these a day, but that might be too much. But a half of my body weight in ounces seems like I do need to eat or drink two of these suckers. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. Right. Because just to give you an example, if you're someone who weighs 200 pounds, you have to drink at least 100 ounces. Then that doesn't take into account if you do a workout. So a a quick tip for those listening, you can weigh yourself before and after workouts as close as possible to nearly nude as possible. Why is that important? If you I've had entrepreneurs that love to train for, let's say, a marathon, they've lost 10 pounds in a marathon training, not even Mm -hmm. in the marathon. So if they, for every pound you lose, you actually need to drink 24 ounces of water. So that person needed to drink 240 ounces to rehydrate for their next performance. I'm not even talking about getting through their day. I'm talking about if they wanted to go run the next day again. So we came up with strategies so they wouldn't have to have that much water every time they train. And then people who do high intensity interval trainings or strength training, they typically lose anywhere between one to two pounds. I've seen three and I've seen more, but typically one to two. So if you're a 200 pound person, you go and work out, you finish your workout, you're at 198. That means you need to drink 100 ounces plus two times 24 is 48, 148 ounces oh, of wow. water Interesting. per day. And we're not even talking about electrolytes yet or sports yeah. beverages or all these other things we hear about or the biohacking salts that are coming out that come oh, from yeah. who knows where. But just literally the baseline where people need to start is at least that hydration of half your body weight in ounces. And then for every pound you lose during an exercise, 24 ounces. I like how you're making this so simple because I think one of the, uh, forgot who I was listening to, but talking about if you get the basics right, the other stuff like the supplements or these salts or these neuro glass, well, I don't care what people are wearing nowadays. Like that's like a percentage of a percentage increment in improvement. And most of it is the placebo effect. And I love my placebo effect. Like it Thanks. works, but I think it's pretty critical. Let's talk about maybe since you've worked with athletes and you're working with yeah. high performers. What are the hidden obvious things we should be doing, distilling them to things that we can actually do every day? Some of us may not be able to train three hours like an athlete or do the, like get these like super expensive supplements. So I want to see what are the principles that you can take from those peak performers that we can apply to our everyday life? Because adding more water to your diet is not difficult. It's not that hard. Right. But think, it is, it's intentional. Would would, it's intentional. It's intentional. Yeah. But you don't know how many times I get on a call with an entrepreneur that's busy all day and he forgets to drink water. And I'm like, all right, we got to figure this out. So we either have him put a post-it note on their MacBook that they're traveling around the with. Pavlov thing, get him yeah. zapped every hour yeah. or something. <laughs> they have a reminder on their computer, on their calendars to drink water. Uh, I send them a check in like, how much water have you had today? They're like, ah, I forgot about this. And they remind themselves. Yeah. So one would think it's very easy. But I've seen it so difficult because they might lean on coffee. They might lean on Diet Cokes, which is a really big one that I've seen like the old school entrepreneurs really drink. Some of these energy drinks that are putting 16 and 17 year old kids in the hospital. How is someone who's in their 30s, 40s and 50s thinking that having an energy drink is going to be helping them, not hurting them? So hydration, it sounds so simple, yet it's something that most of the United States and most entrepreneurs, most people are missing out on. But that's step one, right? So another one of my favorite tips is about protein and fasting. So we okay. always hear people fasting, right? People are like, yeah, sure, fasting is good for you. Research has shown when you fast, you tend to typically overeat because you're restricting yourself from eating. And two, it doesn't boost testosterone. If that's the effect you're looking for, you should fast one week out of the year. Or okay. One time a month if that's the effect you are looking for. And it's actually been shown in women, if you fast, your body tends to hold on to more adipose or fat and actually decrease muscle uh, in our body. So women should not be fasting and not to get gender specific, but that is one area that it has shown if women fast, they actually tend to carry more body fat and lose muscle mass when they fast. But so as you can tell, I'm against fasting because research has shown there's actually a light switch in your body that gets turned on and off every three to four hours. When that light switch gets turned on, it's because you ate protein and it's going to create muscle building. So we're going to build muscle. And every three to four hours, that switch gets turned off. And that yeah. means we're going to be using muscle as energy. So muscle wasting. So our goal is to be eating protein every three to four hours. That doesn't mean in the middle of the night, I want you waking oh. up and slamming a protein shake. So don't worry. It's just a during lot of, the that's a lot hours. of uh, eating in a day. That... Yeah. Yeah. So you should be eating every three to four hours and it should be equally distributed protein. 
when I say equally distributed, it should be about the size of the palm of your hand. All right, Raul, for everyone. And I say that because entrepreneurs all have different hands. My hand is probably different than your hand. We might be the same height, so maybe not. But <laughs> I have had people where they're like, well, I use my partner's hand and it may be too much. It may be too little. So a good rule of thumb is a palm of protein, your palm, every three to four hours. Interesting. That's okay. Well, I mean, the one key thing that I heard about fasting is I think the old rule of the 16-8 was that the, I think they were in scripts here in San Diego that the guy doing the study had to go home after eight hours. So he couldn't do more research around the, the mice or the rats that they were researching on because his spouse or his partner needed him to be home at a certain time, else he'd be in trouble. So I think there, I know there is like some mythology around fasting, but that's actually a little difficult. Sometimes we're in long meetings or like for me, I don't feel like eating until like afternoon. So how do you balance that out? Like how do you balance out the eating portion with time restraints and not doing it because you want to do time restricted fasting, but more around balancing every three, three hours of eating every time. It's a lot. I'm getting to pound a protein later this afternoon. So like, how does that, no, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. So how does that work? So when I, when you, so you mentioned a pound of protein. So if we go back to that light switch, if you had a light switch in your office, if you just press it with the, all of your might and power, is the light going to get brighter or stay the same? Stay the same. It's going to stay the same. So because you ate that pound of protein, it's still going to turn off in three to four hours. What you mm. should be doing is dividing that pound of protein equally throughout the day and have four ounces when you wake up, four ounces at lunchtime, four ounces as an afternoon snack, and then four mm. ounces in the evening. Because if not, you're loading it at that one time by having that pound of protein, but then it's still getting turned off. So you're not maximizing your body building muscle. You're allowing it to do it in that three to four hour window, but then it shuts off. Interesting. So it would be spreading your meals more often. And this is shown by research. This isn't me just no, I know something no, because I, I think it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> because the research, so it had uh, two groups of men and it had them do the same exact workouts. They had the same amount of calories that was meant for muscle building, right? Because yeah. obviously there were different heights and whatnot. So they had them have, everything was the same. It was a very controlled study. And the only difference was is how they distributed their protein. So they had someone, well, not someone, half of the group had, for breakfast, which would be similar to a standard American diet, they might have an egg for breakfast. For lunch, they might have a chicken breast. And for dinner, they'd have a big steak. The other group had it equally distributed. And after 16 weeks, they found, I don't remember the exact number, but I could pull it up. I believe it was an 8% difference in muscle growth. Which oh, wow. Is, yeah, so I'm leaving gains huge on the table difference. Is what you're saying. You're leaving gains on the table <laughs> by eating one Damn, pound at one sitting. And again, I tell people, as you said, like you're not that hungry in the morning. It's like, well, is it because you're eating a bigger portion at one time? Or is it because we've gotten into the habit of not eating? So I always start with just starting something small. It could be a protein shake. It could be eggs. It could be, I've had people start with just literally three almonds. There was a, a lawyer I was working with and she's, I'm not hungry anymore. So I'm like, just start with anything. And she's, what about almonds? I'm like, perfect. And she start, she sent me pictures, three almonds in her hands. I was like, hey, that's <laughs> a starting point. Everyone's go different. Okay. Got to go with it, right? And eventually we got more into more animal-based proteins versus the plant-based. And then when you have those long meetings, how can I help you plan for what that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're in a long meeting, what are things you can bring with you? I spoke about hydration, but you could bring protein shakes in with you and no one's going to bat an eye. You could bring a protein bar if you're able to chew. But most of the times, most entrepreneurs I'm in, if they're in a very long meeting, they can't be like, hey, Raul, well, give me a second. So let's yeah, talk about yeah. protein. You'd be like, hey, dude, we're going to have to end this stream real quick. So go finish what you need to and come back. But having a simple protein shake or even a smoothie with some sort of protein, I'm prioritizing protein because we're talking about that muscle building Yeah, to have something while you're just in that meeting and it allows you to keep that muscle building switch on without having to think twice about it. So normally would be, let's say you work out at six or seven, you'd have to eat right after you take on, you're talking about like the 15 minutes right after a workout or ah the anabolic window. So there was research done on this. I what was the gentleman's name. I, I want, I want to say his name was Bill Campbell, but I could be wrong. He does research in nutrition and he works with an NHL team. And he was talking about research he did on a professional yeah. hockey team. And he was looking at the anabolic window and what he found out was it doesn't matter for the anabolic window, as long as you eat enough protein throughout the day. Okay. But what he does, what he does, <laughs> let me quote this here, is that he still gives those players a recovery shake. Why? Because we tend to forget. And then we oh. try to overload at a different point in time instead of doing equally distributed. So the hmm. anabolic window is not as important as we once thought. And I used to be the same person. I still do preach eating something 
within 30 minutes of working out because it creates that habit. It allows you to ensure that you are recovering. Okay. That guy who did the research on it states the same thing. Like he still does it, gives something to the players within, right? They get off the ice. But as long as you're eating enough protein equally throughout the day, you should be fine. But since we're here on building habits, it's better to eat something afterwards. Because if not, as an entrepreneur, you work out at 637. You forget what happens. You go on through the rest of your day. Then it's nighttime and you're grouchy or grumpy Raul that no one wants to deal with because you're hungry. And then you try to overload all the protein at once. And now you've only turned on that muscle building switch for three to four hours before bed. And now the rest of the day, you're wondering why you're not making any gains in the gym or why you plateaued at the gym or why you're not feeling as energized throughout the day. Interesting. These are incremental habits that I think do add up. So I'm just thinking out loud here, eating at eight, 11, two, and then five. That's what you're Give saying. Yeah. It, it, so eight to 12, because that's four hours. It doesn't have to be three. It could be three to four. So let's say 12. Okay. Cause... Then another time at four and then another time between six and eight, and then you're good to go. Even some people I have eat a snack before bed. If you're someone who doesn't like to eat before workouts, then I would actually want you to have a snack before bed that is carb rich and protein rich. So mm-hmm. that way you have those energy stores in you so that you can push harder the next day. Um, I like I, doing I, it like an hour before the workout, like a coffee or something. But I agree. That's what I typically promote. However, there's people who wake up and they really just don't like to eat or drink anything. And I tell them yeah, that they're putting me. themselves at a disadvantage. <laughs> However, weird. if you can, great. But if not, the str- I have to work with who I'm with. And yeah. it really depends on the person. Like going back to you, you just said, like, I don't like to eat that much throughout the day. I'm going to eat a pound of protein later. And here I am laughing. Like, no, he's pulling my leg. And you're like, no, this is actually how I eat. No, I can send you the screenshot of the things I eat every day. It's the same stuff. Every well, day. I'll be waiting for the <laughs> screenshot then. If you don't send it, then I'm going to be upset. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I'm not kidding. So water. Okay. Hydration, half your body weight in ounces. So that's probably 60 to 120 Sweet. ounces a day. And then from the protein side, the classic eat every four hours, but demystifying the need for fasting and that I think that's a healthy approach too. Sometimes fasting just feels good for the brain. And I do know that can be true, but it could also be a placebo effect. What else? So those are like the two ones I see. And then carbs. We have to talk about carbs. Okay. I I like my carbs. Yeah. Oh, good. (laughs) I love them too. So I went to a comedy show a couple weeks ago with some friends of mine and it was a bachelor party. And they're all talking about their jobs, entrepreneur in tech, yada, yada. The the comedian gets to me. He says, what do you do for work? I'm like, well, I'm a performance dietitian. The crowd all of a sudden, Raul goes, boo. I was like, what did I do to people? They're like, don't take away their carbs. And I was just like, wait a minute. No one knows me here. Number one. Number two, why would I take away carbs? I absolutely preach carbs. Mm -hmm. And going through my own research. So when I got my undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry, I got my master's in nutrition. When I did my master's in nutrition, I thought the first thing they were going to say is stay away from carbs, do low carbs, especially during that time, it was the South Beach diet and Atkins that were very popular. So that's what I thought it took to be successful. And then now we're seeing a resurgence of it with some of the other people such as Carnivore MD, Liver King, Luckily, Liver King, when he came out, I was one of the people to be like, he's on steroids. And I had people send me stuff like, no, he's all natural. And it's like, oh, dude, when you look that good and that perfect, it's always on. There's always something, right? But they talk about that. I haven't seen like him just to, I just look anytime someone looks picture perfect, they're not, they're on something. There's something. So athletes and high performers tend to stay away from carbs because they're worried about it causing the weight gain. When Mm. we know that carbs are our body's fuel source. Yeah. Literally, there's only two places in our bodies that can store carbs. But I would where, take a guess. You, I'm gonna let you just guess one. I don't want to put you on the spot for two, but I, take a guess of one I where the know. body stores carbs. <laughs> I have no clue. Adipose and muscle. I'm not sure. Okay, muscle. You're absolutely right with one. So it's stored in our muscles and in our liver, and that is it. It is really? not stored in adipose. Adipose is fat. Fat is that, and that's it. If you consume excess calories, then yes, it can be converted. But it's been shown that what goes into adipose tissue is anywhere between one to 3%. The rest of the 97% is stored in our muscles and in our liver. So every time we do a low carb diet, you're literally just depleting your muscles and then asking your liver, which is the detoxifying unit and the powerhouse of your body, not talking about your brain or heart, talking about the other organs to detox and utilize the energy it has and spread it out through your body. That's the only other place. So when you do Hmm. a low carb diet, you typically feel tired, you feel fatigued, 
you can't lift as much because you literally just took the gas out of your car and you're expecting it to oh work. yeah no it sucks it sucks and yeah. people try to convert me to the fat-based only keto stuff i couldn't do it no <laughs> it way like man that, it felt horrible my background is really big into rice and beans and if my abuela heard i was cutting out rice and beans she might smack me behind you the head be with her house, yeah yeah <laughs> so i would carbs like so many high performers are ditching them trying to convert and hmm. when they come to me and they've done keto and we put them back on carbs they do see their weight fluctuate because we have to remember carbohydrate hydrate water so yes when you do a low carb diet you will see a fast weight drop but it will be hmm. water weight it won't be actual weight loss hmm. so when you actually eat carbs you will see your scale go up but you also see your performance go up you will see your energy go up you will see your strength gains go up and typically you also see your body fat go down because now you have enough energy in your muscles that we're not using them as energy. And one thing that a lot of these keto guys don't talk about, keto guys and gals, is that gluconeogenesis. Gluco means carb, neo means new, genesis means creation of. So creation of a new carb. That word is what happens when we don't eat enough carbohydrates and we eat too much protein. Our body will actually take the protein we eat and convert it to a carbohydrate for Interesting. energy. Yeah. So when people do these keto diets, I actually ask them like how much protein you're eating and they're actually eating way too much protein. So their body <laughs> says, ah, we'll just convert that to a carb. So they could have just had that slice of bread, that cup of rice, instead of just cutting it out and eating all the protein that they feel like is actually helping them when it could be hurting them. Interesting. And then just the fourth thing, just because you you ask, I think so many people use culture as an objection versus an asset. So what do I mean? One of the entrepreneurs I've worked with recently He's of Italian background and he's from New York and he's, I love pizza and pasta from New York. I'm like, cool, man. I think most people in the world do. It tastes pretty good. Yeah. And he said, I can't eat it. I go into these binges because he was being open and honest with me that he would just go and just eat all the pasta and all the pizza. And I was like, well, why don't we just let you have pizza and pasta every week instead of doing low carb? He went up to New York for a trip. He's based out of California and Florida. Mm -hmm. And he went up to visit family. He's, I had the pizza and pasta and I didn't binge. I actually didn't go for it all. And it, it's so many people when we're told that we have to cut out our cultural foods. Me growing up, I was told I had to cut out rice and beans. Um, no matter where you're from, we're told that what we are grown and told to eat, we have to cut out to be successful. But it's actually the opposite. We want to include those foods more often because Lean that's what's going to make yeah. the diet sustainable. Those incremental habits we were just mentioning. Going back to just me saying it, if you want to do good work, you have to have good fuel. Honestly, yeah. like there's no 100%. other way about it. And the more you're depleting your carbs, you're eating way too much protein, you're not having enough water, and you're cutting out foods that you actually love, you're putting yourself back more than anything else. Dude, I really appreciate this because this is like a culmination of, I mean, not only your years, but like just me learning on my own and struggling and failing like this. These are the principles that come back. What do you think about fiber? Because I know that gut health is like the key to all of our like physical health and i've been focusing a lot on fiber recently and just taking more what is it a psyllium whatever that husk is psyllium husk yeah, yeah. i've been taking so, that as a nightcap how it's so strong <laughs> my dad would say like a nightcap's like a beer or a cocktail if i told them i was talking to you and i will have an psyllium husk some magnesium nightcap, and husk yeah. that's my thing man you'll see it on the screenshot <laughs> so i love the mag i'm always which is it magnesium bisglycinate, magnesium threonate? Do you know which magnesium you're taking? I think it's the C, magnesium. I have no idea. Whatever the, what's ever in Calm. Oh, Calm. So Calm has uh, citrate, magnesium citrate. citrate that's the one yeah. that's in it. And I love it, but can also make you want to run to the bathroom and do number two. So just be aware of that. I typically tell people not to drink it in the mornings because you don't want to be in the middle oh, of the yeah. call no. and be like, I got to run. Definitely it makes nice you thing. tired, in my opinion. I agree. But some people, it has that laxative effect. So when we're talking about fiber and the importance of it and gut health, so even just going back a minute on gut health, we hear about all these probiotic companies that are coming out that the greens powder is going to help build the probiotic health. Well, what I will say is that right now we don't have enough research to understand what a probiotic can actually do. What, what do I mean? Gut is, right? What a healthy gut is. We're literally going into the Amazon and throwing house cats in. If you throw a house cat in the Amazon, it's going to get eaten by a leopard real quick or a snake or some sort of giant spider that we haven't <laughs> discovered yet or yeah. some other people that are native that we don't know live there. So these probiotics that we're giving, there's not much research. There's actually a website called usprobiotics.gov, I believe, or .com. 
and it shows which probiotics work for what conditions. And it shows mm-hmm. the level of validity from one to four, I believe. And I believe one is very weak evidence and four is strong evidence. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a good resource for people listening in to go see if the probiotic you are taking is actually helpful. So that's the mm-hmm. first thing in gut health. We don't know what we're putting in it yet because we just have no idea yet. We don't have the science yet. I do believe it is key to gut health. Yeah. There was a dietitian I worked with closely. He worked with the homeless population. And what he did is he put them on a ketogenic diet for a month because that cleaned out the gut because you're not giving it any fiber. Yeah. You're actually killing all the bacteria in there. And then he started to reintroduce fiber after that month. And many of those people that were homeless had better mental acuity. They were just feeling better. So mm-hmm. fiber is the key. So I'm not saying people should go on a keto cut and then go introduce Dental fiber. fiber yeah. But it shows that we it's just so nuanced. There's so much to learn. But going into fiber, there's something I love to share. It's called the carb to fiber ratio. So okay. if you look at any product that is a carbohydrate, so let's talk about breads, rice, pasta, quinoa, any of those things, chips, crackers, you want to look at the total amounts of carbohydrates in grams and divide it by the total amount of fiber in grams. So to yeah. give you an example, these are going to be three that I'm going to throw out to you, Raul, and I want you to think which one you think is going to be the best and which one's going to be the worst. So when we think about best and worst, what I mean is premium fuel or regular fuel. So premium okay. fuel, you're going to put in that Ferrari. I know we're going electric now, but just bear with just me go, here. I'll so, go with you. Yeah. I'll go with you. <laughs> so in a Ferrari, we're going to put that premium gas. When you put that regular gas, it's not going to run as well. Now, if you have a Toyota Corolla and you put premium gas, it's going to run way better. You get a couple more miles per gallon. If you put that regular gas, it's just going to do what it does. So when I work with someone, I envision them as a Ferrari. And we're going to put that premium gas. That's going to make them run at the best. Mm-hmm. When we talk about that carb to fiber ratio. You want anything that's five to one or less. Anything that is 10 to one and above is that regular fuel. Okay. Mm. Okay. So let's, uh, I'm going to give three examples, special K cinnamon toast crunch and lucky charms. If I told you those three without taking a guess, which one do you think is going to have the most premium fuel? So it's going to have the best carb to fiber ratio. And which one do you think is going to have the most regular fuel? I think that they all have the same, but I think special K without the sugar, then the toast and the lucky. Okay. It actually goes lucky charms is the best then You're cinnamon kidding. toast crunch and then <laughs> well and the last one is special k and i'll be honest with you i used to not use lucky charms but one time a client who loved lucky charms but he was told he was never able to have it and i was like yeah there's no way that's gonna be a good carbon fiber ratio get out of here i went to the grocery store the next day and i saw it and i was like i gotta put my tail between my legs and i i said to the client like hey it's actually got a decent carbon fiber ratio now let me explain so the special k i believe is a 25 to 1 so that means it's going to boost your energy up and crash it back down. And that's why when Special K at a certain point in time had a two week long diet for people, they would always be hungry and have very low energy because they'd have that big spike and that big crash. Then Cinnamon Toast Crunch, I believe, is a 12 and a half to one. And the Lucky Charms was an 11 to one. Now, it doesn't fit that five to one ratio, as I mentioned yeah. earlier. But when you mention those three typical cereals, you try to find the best of what's available. Sometimes you may not have that five to one ratio. But again, like an oatmeal will most most of the time, I say most because you never know. And I want to comment on what you just said, sugar. Most people say the same thing to me. They're like, well, Tony, what about the sugar and Lucky Charms? When your body processes a carbohydrate, it doesn't care where that sugar comes from. It will process it as a sugar. But the fiber will stop it from being hmm. released all at once as a big jolt of energy. Yeah. And then that fiber will also help you excrete out anything that you have. So it does help with gut health because it feeds those gut bacteria. So I know I'm going all over, but trying to no, bring no. it right back in yeah. of the importance of it. So looking at a good carb to fiber ratio when it comes to your whole grains is what you're looking for. Five to one. And, and not to demystify or talk about the sugar issue here. That's its own podcast, but like sugar isn't bad for you. It's like the consensus that it's not hundred percent bad for you as we thought it used to be, unless it's overloaded. Depends. I say that because for people that train, like if you're running a marathon and you're an endurance athlete, you need sugar to give you fuel in those muscles. If you're someone who does HIIT training. So for example, I did a competition last summer. I needed sugar. I ate gummy bears in between because I was doing five different activities within the whole day. And you don't want to have a lot of fat because that could hurt the stomach. You don't want to have a lot of protein because that could also, when I say hurt the stomach, it just takes a long time to digest. So it could give you stomach cramps, diarrhea, things like that. You still want protein to help with the muscle building. Right now, you're just looking for energy. And the quickest way to get that energy is with something that has sugar. And many of the clients I work with before and after workouts, I have them have those foods that have sugar because that's when your body can utilize it for number one energy and then also for recovery post-workout. 
right? So if you're someone who really loves Lucky Charms, I'm going to tell you, you're going to go get Lucky Charms post-workout with a protein shake or a glass of milk. So you get that protein and you get those carbs to help recover quickly. That's cool. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Very, so there's a way very... to utilize it. That's yeah. why I, I don't like to shy away from foods because every food should fit. And the lifestyle thing is what the number one thing, like the, the sustaining it, not a temporary season. It's like for life, like yes. the stuff I do, like, I don't care if it's this, like this for the next 50, 60, 70 years. It's cool. Yep. And so many people jump on the trend where they do it and they think they get the results, but then they go back to what they were originally. And I, it frustrates me because I don't want them to go through it because I've gone through it. And it sounds like you've gone through it too, where you've tried something. I've tried it everything. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Hey, same man. <laughs> the vegan, carnivore, high fat, the fasting, the all this stuff, all these different flavors and tastes. Same. And it's frustrating because you want to figure it out. And it really is, as I said earlier, don't let that culture be the obstacle. Let it be your... Yeah let it be your friend use it as an asset and eat the foods you love and it's just so it's so contra to what's going on now and what's always been part of diet culture nutrition we keep trying to biohack when we don't even have the foundation you're trying to build a roof on a house that you don't even have the foundation set you're trying yeah. to bring in a really shiny new fridge without having a house built hey it's cool to have a really cool fridge but i can see through your front and back door and everyone can your whole neighborhood can yeah. Like you don't have anything being built. Oh, these are the foundation pieces. So just to recap, it's the water hydration, the protein every four hours. The third is not shying away from carbs. And then right. the fourth, looking at the carb to fiber ratio to see if it's a high quality premium fuel, five to one. So I'll remember that. And I think the- Using the culture a, as your asset, not as easy. an obstacle. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Sweet. Well, Tony, for our listeners, what's the best place for people to want to thank you for being on and learn a little bit more about you? Uh, Raul, thank you for having me on, man. I absolutely loved this conversation. It was a pleasure. And if they want to learn more about me, they can go to nutritionfp.com backslash do good work. And there's three things at the bottom of that website. They can do a executive wellness check, which will be just 10 questions to see how they are within regards to their nutrition. The second thing they can get is a habit tracker, which is something I've used with many of my clients. It will help them change their habits within 30 days. There's a video to explain it all. It's a video of me obviously talking. And the third one is if they do feel like this was the right fit, they can schedule a call with me. We can do a energy or diet audit to see really where they are and where they need to be at. So those are three things at NutritionFP, which stands for performance.com backslash do good work. And just a reminder, I was there too. As we started earlier, I'm an entrepreneur. I've fallen for all these tricks. When I did them all, I didn't know what protein powder to get. I didn't know what fat burner worked or didn't work. Fun fact, most fat burners only burn the amount of calories as a Hershey's kiss. So they're yeah. absolutely useless. <laughs> and most BCA supplements come from bird feathers. So if you drink BCAAs, you're just drinking oh, bird feathers. Dang. We could talk about supplements all day. It's oh one of my, my favorite goodness. things to talk about. So just that I've been there. I've been through all the fad diets. I've tried all the supplements. And it wasn't until I started to work and understand the background of what's happening and how to use it with high performers was it that I was truly able to understand it. So I've been there. I can empathize. So if you want to find out more about me, nutritionfp.com backslash do good work. We'll put those links in the show notes. Tony, thanks again. Thanks. If you found value in today's podcast, please consider sharing this with someone that you believe could also benefit from this episode. You never know, you may be the catalyst that opens them up to a new way of operating their business and experiencing life. As always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.